Uh, dear Jens, uh, dear Boris, uh, dear members of the press, um, this is quite an exercise and it shows how NATO and allies work together, even, even making such uh, visits happen. And it's my great pleasure to welcome you both in Estonia. Uh, I wish it could be under more pleasant circumstances. Uh, we are here because the security of Europe has changed dramatically. After a long and aggressive lead-up in Georgia, Crimea, Donbas uh, last week, all the masks came off and the whole world can now see. Putin has gone from an autocrat to an outright aggressor and Russia from a difficult neighbour to a rogue state. Putin has unleashed 200,000 soldiers against a free and sovereign country. Their targets, hospitals, schools, kindergartens, innocent Ukrainian lives. And we unfortunately expect to witness even more horrors, including indiscriminate bombings. We mourn all the lives lost in Putin's war. We are also seeing dangerous neglect of nuclear safety by Russian troops. We have just learned Lukashenko's troops have also entered uh, Ukraine. There is no doubt Belarus is a go-aggressor in this conflict. The whole international community must now stand up against the evil. Allies have been united against the aggression since the very beginning, and I'm very glad to say that. We have witnessed a fundamental change of policies across the democratic world, all in support of Ukraine and aimed uh, in isolating the aggressor. Some of them seemed even unthinkable a uh, few days ago. NATO needs a forward defence strategy. Uh, NATO should be um, prepared to defend the most vulnerable part of NATO, which is the Baltic countries. And this includes on land um, establishing permanent increased forward presence um, in air, establishing a credible uh, defence posture and a sense of urgency in developing uh, NATO's upgraded uh, defence uh, plan. At the same time, we need to continue our urgent support to Ukraine. Military aid is critical here. Estonia will continue with support as we provide significant military, financial and humanitarian aid. We cannot stop until we have stopped Putin. This is what we simply must do for ending the brutal violence and destruction and for helping the brave people of Ukraine. And Ukraine should be given a very clear signal to join the EU. The security of Ukraine is the security of Europe. Although uh, there is no direct military threat at our borders, NATO must take a leap now and adopt rapidly to the new security situation. We must move from forward presence to forward defence and from air policing to air defence. I welcome the decisions already um, taken to strengthen the defence here. We are today in Tapa, uh, where we can witness the real collective efforts and commitment of NATO. I would like to thank the United Kingdom and all the allies who are already present here in Estonia and also sending additional troops uh, to Baltic region. We must work together to help Ukraine and to strengthen our own defence. Thank you. Thank you. Prime Minister Boris Johnson, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Kaya. Thank you for your welcome. Great to see you, Jens, and uh, great to be here again in, in TAPA, uh, this very, very important mission. Uh, NATO is perhaps unique in the history of defensive alliances because it has stood for over 70 years, uh, not for aggression, but for peace and stability. And during those years, the alliance has been tested many times in the Cold War, in the Balkans, in Afghanistan. This matters because the world has become a more dangerous and a more contested place. A few short days ago, we all stood witness to scenes we hoped we would never see again on the continent of Europe. 
a sovereign democratic people fighting for their lives against a foe who wishes to subjugate them by force. As we realise the terrible extent of President <coughs> Putin's ambitions, the world has been rightly united in praise for the valour and bravery of the Ukrainian people, led by President Volodymyr Zelensky. And uh, I expect, like uh, colleagues here, I've had the privilege of speaking to President Zelensky virtually every day since the Russian invasion, and I've heard firsthand his sheer determination that the freedom his people have experienced must never be snatched away. And indeed, it's clearer day by day from the way the uh, Ukrainians are responding that President Putin has made a disastrous <coughs> miscalculation. His troops have not been welcomed into Ukraine as he prophesied, and instead the Ukrainians have mounted an astonishing and tenacious resistance. We, as the international community, have a responsibility to do everything we can to help the Ukrainians in their efforts. And that's why the UK has trained 22,000 members of the Ukrainian armed forces and why we've provided further defensive military support to Ukraine. And we have a responsibility to all uh, Ukrainians. That's why the UK has provided £140 million in humanitarian aid to Ukraine and to the region. It's why we've deployed both humanitarian experts and hundreds of military logistics experts <coughs> to Ukraine's neighbours to help them shelter those seeking sanctuary on their shores. And it's why we've announced the first phase of a bespoke humanitarian route for the people of Ukraine to come to the UK. It's also why, alongside allies across the world, the UK has swiftly executed the biggest package of sanctions ever imposed against a G20 nation. And we've seen organisations from banks to oil companies to football leagues uh, to singing competitions who've made it clear that Vladimir Putin must be, and his regime must be isolated from the international community uh, for his actions. As we support the people of Ukraine, we must also shore up our shared resilience, both to protect our people and our values. These are nothing more than defensive measures, which have been the essence of NATO for more than 70 years. And I want to be crystal clear, finally, on that point. Uh, we will not fight Russian forces in Ukraine, and our reinforcements, like these reinforcements here in Tapa, are firmly within the borders of NATO members, and they are profoundly the right thing to do. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Secretary General Stoltenberg, please. Prime Minister Kallas, uh, Prime Minister Johnson, dear uh, Kaya and dear Boris, it's great to be with you here at uh, TAPA. It's great to be uh, back and uh, we are here to meet the soldiers uh, that are defending Estonia, our alliance and our values. These soldiers are keeping our nation safe and free and we owe them a debt of uh, gratitude. Thank you to Estonia for hosting our battle group so well and uh, being such a staunch uh, NATO ally. And let me also thank the United Kingdom and you, Boris, uh, for leading this uh, NATO multinational battle group here at the Tapa base in Estonia and for doing so for the last uh, five years. And also for doubling your contribution over the last uh, few weeks with more British uh, troops uh, coming to Estonia. This really makes a huge difference and demonstrates NATO solidarity. We stand together uh, in this time of crisis. The people of Ukraine are fighting bravely against the brutal and unprovoked Russian invasion. We utterly condemn the Kremlin's war. Allies are imposing severe costs on Russia through sanctions. We are increasing NATO presence across the alliance to deter and to defend. And we are stepping up our support to help Ukraine defend itself. NATO allies are sending uh, Ukraine anti-tank weapons, air defense missiles and ammunition. Allies are also providing millions of euros worth of um, financial help and humanitarian aid. I commend Estonia and the United Kingdom 
for the resistance uh, uh, you are uh, providing to uh, Ukraine. Over the last weeks, in response to Russia's attack on Ukraine, we have increased our defensive presence in the air, on land and at sea, with over 100 jets at high alert operating from 30 different locations and over 120 ships from the Baltic Sea to the Mediterranean. The UK, the US and other allies are deploying thousands more troops to the eastern part of the alliance. For the first time in our history, we are deploying the NATO response force. Because there must be no doubt, no room for miscalculation or misunderstanding, our commitment to Article 5 of the Washington Treaty is ironclad. We will protect and defend every inch of NATO territory. Credible deterrence prevents conflict and preserves peace. NATO is a defensive alliance. We do not seek conflict with Russia. Our message to President Putin is stop the war, pull out all your forces from Ukraine, and engage in good faith in diplomatic efforts. The world stands with Ukraine in calling for peace. So, uh, Kaya and Boris, it's great to be with you here again, and we stand together in the alliance, united in our condemnation of the Russian nation of Ukraine. Thank you. We are now at your disposal for questions. Please state your name and media organization you are representing and to whom the question is addressed to. Please use microphone, my colleague will assist. Hello, I am Katrin Arma from Estonian Television. I have a question to Prime Minister Boris Johnson. Um, your country has supported uh, volunteers who are ready to fight on the ground in uh, Ukraine. What do you think, under which circumstances should NATO get directly involved in fighting in Ukraine? Well, thank you very much. And uh, look, I'm going to be very clear about this because uh, you're, you're not quite right in what you say about supporting uh, volunteers going to fight on the ground. The UK is not uh, actively doing such a thing. Uh, but I, I understand, of course, uh, the feelings of people who feel emotionally engaged in this conflict, because I cannot think of a time in international affairs when the difference between right and wrong, between good and bad, uh, uh, between a good and evil has been so obvious. And it is clear that the, the people of Ukraine have right on their side. And I can understand why people feel as they do. But we have uh, laws in our country about uh, about uh, international conflicts and how they must be conducted. And uh, on, your, on your point, as, as both Kaira and Jens have, have stressed, uh, NATO is a, is a defensive alliance. Uh, I think for uh, any NATO member to get involved actively in uh, conflict with, with Russia is a very, very, uh, is a huge step which is not being contemplated by any member. And you would have to go to uh, to parliaments and to, and to, uh, and to peoples uh, to get agreement for such, a, for such a step. That is not on the agenda. What is on the agenda is offering the humanitarian support uh, that we are, uh, offering the, uh, the logistical, the uh, defensive but lethal military support that, that we are and we're offering it in ever-growing uh, quantities, but also uh, the economic uh, pressure uh, that the West is now applying to, uh, to the, uh, uh, the Putin regime. And I think it, it, one thing is clear. Uh, they, the, the Vladimir Putin miscalculated two things. He miscalculated the, the strength of the Ukrainian resistance, and he also uh, miscalculated and underestimated uh, the strength of Western unity and Western resolve uh, to ensure that, that Putin must fail. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Raghi Omar on behalf of uh, all British uh, broadcasters. There's a question to all three of you, actually. Um, Kharkiv city is under heavy bombardment. Um, the capital, Kiev, is being surrounded and has a column of heavy armor stretching somewhere between 25 and 30 miles towards it. 
Uh, do you think that given uh, the tactics being deployed by Russian forces, uh, um, edging towards indiscriminate use of munitions in civilian areas, means that given Russia's overwhelming uh, superiority that cities in Ukraine, including the capital, will inevitably fall. And then one specific one for you, Prime Minister Johnson. Um, the UN Security Council is at the heart of the system of global peace and security. Britain, like Russia, is a permanent member. Do you think that you would support moves to suspend Russia from the UN Security Council? Um, yes, um, what we are seeing in, in Ukraine uh, is, is uh, really uh, very horrifying uh, to see what, uh, what kind of steps they are taking and, and how they are uh, you know, escalating this uh, crisis. Um, the question whether the cities will, will fall, I think uh, uh, we underestimate uh, the Ukrainians' motivation and will to protect their, uh, protect their cities. Of course, we also know that the, the forces are not really equal. Uh, so uh, one is to really conquer the cities and the other uh, one is to keep uh, keep those uh, cities under control. So I think there's going to be a lot of uh, resistance from Ukrainians, and and this even if you know temporarily uh, Russia takes hold of the cities, it's still very hard to keep. And uh, and as there is no support from the Ukrainian Ukrainian side, so I think uh, what we have seen and the old Ukrainians have really uh, surprised everybody is is by their motivation to fight for their country, to fight for their freedom. I think the same would be here because we have already lost our freedom once, and we don't we don't want to lose it a uh, second time. So I think uh, you know all the nation is is up to defend their country and. Uh, to take it uh, back even after you know building the resistance uh, in in uh, in the nation really to take those back yes and just uh, Ra raggy on your, on your point about uh, what's happening in in Kharkiv it's a, it's a absolutely sickening and if it, remi it reminds me if anything if you remember the shelling of Sarajevo uh, market uh, by uh, by the Serbs it, the shelling of uh, of innocent people in Bosnia it has that feel to me of an atrocity uh, committed deliberately against uh, a civilian center and i think that uh, coming to your to your second point uh, you know within the the un structures it's very difficult to uh, to move people uh, without a vote and and clearly where you have uh, a majority where you have a veto in the security council you, you can't uh, there's a paradox that like we can't vote to change the the rules without a, uh, without the agreement of the of the russians but what is happening is that I think that the, the great middle of the, of the UN congregation, if you like, uh, is starting to realise quite how horrific this is. And with every day that goes by, as they, as they watch the heroism of the Ukrainian resistance, and they see what's happening in Ukraine, and they see uh, episodes like the, the shelling, uh, like the, the, uh, the missile in, in Kharkiv and the destruction of uh, civilian populations, I think people's stomachs are being turned uh, by what's happening. And they're, they're seeing that it is necessary to stand up uh, against Russian aggression uh, to support uh, the Ukrainians and, uh, and to endorse uh, our, our strategy, which is that President Putin must not be allowed to succeed. He must, he must fail in Ukraine. So what we now see is a new wave of attack against uh, Ukraine, against innocent uh, people and a column of heavy Russian armor which is moving towards uh, Kiev uh, will bring more death, uh, more suffering and more civilian casualties. And that's the reason why we need to continue to provide support to uh, Ukraine, uh, why we continue to call on Russia to stop this bloody war and why we need to impose costs by the heavy sanctions on uh, Russia. And uh, uh, why we also should uh, uh, once again uh, commend uh, the bravery and the courage of the Ukrainian people, uh, the Ukrainian armed forces and uh, also the Ukrainian President uh, Volodymyr Zelensky. Um, this is horrifying, this is uh, totally unacceptable and it's a blatant violation of international law. Thank you. Uh, Alexander Bilak, Telefi News. 
uh, a question for question to Boris Johnson. Uh, by the middle of the March, the UK will have sent here about 2,000 troops. Uh, that's definitely a big uh, support for us. But uh, what would happen? What would uh, have to happen, uh, or what would be the trigger point for you uh, to double it or triple it, or or what's the limit? Limit. Well, uh, th th thank you, thank you very much. We're, we're, we're very proud to be uh, working here with uh, our friends, uh, with, I think, with our French friends, with our, our Danish uh, friends, uh, and of course with our wonderful uh, Estonian uh, hosts. And I, uh, I'm, I'm delighted that we're, we're doubling it. Uh, it's a big commitment that we're that we're making. Uh, I think that you know we'll uh, we'll always keep things under review. But what you can take it from me that our priority is. Uh, the safety, the security uh, of our friends and partners across the whole of the eastern uh, frontier of NATO. And uh, we're increasing our presence not just in Estonia, but in Poland, in the skies above Romania, uh, in the eastern Mediterranean, in the, in the Black Sea. Uh, the UK is, is beefing up uh, our presence in, uh, in, on NATO's eastern, uh, eastern flank. And uh, the, the message we need to get over, and I think we are, collectively, all of us, uh, is that if Vladimir Putin thinks he's going to push NATO back uh, by what he's doing, he's, he's gravely mistaken. This will end up with, uh, with a fortified and strengthened uh, NATO uh, on, his, on, on his western uh, flank. Uh, he'll have more NATO, not less NATO. Thank you. Unfortunately, this is all the time we had. Uh, thank you, everyone, for coming. This Danish television. I, 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 go on. Something, something tells me this will, this will, you will have a brilliant question. We'll yes, on. of course I will. You've doubled your number of troops here at the base in Tapa. Denmark is due to arrive next week. Yes. Would you like to see Denmark increase the number of troops here as well? I, I, all I can say is that I, uh, I, I had a, a great conversation with Meta, with your Prime Minister, uh, the other day. She was, she was fantastically uh, robust. I think she understands the problem uh, very well. I'm, I'm glad that Denmark is, uh, is increasing uh, its contribution. We work well with our Danish friends and, uh, and uh, of course, it's always good that uh, uh, Denmark is, is contributing more. But I, I, I hesitate to, to go beyond that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Can I just ask you, based on the questions that you got, Based on the questions, Marika Walsh with the Globe and Mail, this morning you got some tough questions from a Ukrainian reporter. And today, this afternoon, you're telling the crowd here, we as the international community have responsibility to do everything we can to help the Ukrainians in their efforts. So are you actually doing that if you are not granting the request from Ukraine for a no-fly zone? Thank you. And, and I just want to get back to the, to, and to, to the points that uh, Kaya and Jens and, and all of us have made uh, today. It is very, very important to understand uh, that uh, NATO is a defensive alliance. It's out, this is a time when miscalculation and misunderstanding is all too possible, and it's therefore crucial that we get that, uh, we get that message over. Uh, that does not mean uh, that we cannot help our friends, uh, or it does not mean that they do not have a right to self-defence, and we can help them in that self-defence, and that is what we are doing. But when it comes to a no-fly zone, uh, which is, I think, what you asked, in the skies above uh, Ukraine, we have to accept the reality that that involves uh, shooting down uh, Russian planes, as I said in an answer to, I think, the first question. Uh, th that's a very, very big step. It is simply not on uh, the agenda of any NATO country. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. This concludes the press conference. Thank you for following.